Hey, listeners, we're quickly popping in to let you know about a fundraiser we're running inspired by this episode. A few weeks ago, we had a thoughtful listener write in to ask that we dedicate our author episode to an organization recently affected by JKR's transphobia. When the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Center hired a trans CEO, JKR's foundation pulled their funding from the center, and JKR opened up her own single-sex rape crisis service. It's a private business that claims to be, quote, a sexual violence support service for women run by women, end quote. In contrast, the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Center supports survivors of all genders aged 12 plus who have experienced sexual violence at any time in their lives. The Edinburgh Rape Crisis Center faces regular transphobic attacks from the press and public and a lack of funding such that they are unable to meet the huge demand for support in the city. If you want a great way to say fuck you to JKR's transphobia, please support our fundraiser and help the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Center in their life-saving work. You can find a link to our fundraiser in the show notes, on Instagram, and on our website. We originally set a goal of $1,000, but you absolute rock stars blew that out of the water before we recorded this episode. So we've set a new goal of $5,000. And we're confident that you're going to blow that one out of the water as well. So keep that in mind as you listen to our new episode and get progressively more angry. Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman. And Hannah, I would like you to tell me what it is like living in the world as an auteur in the sorting chat. Okay, yeah, I am an author. C'est vraiment vrai. C'est vraiment vrai. I am an author and that is... Very funny, because when I think about the author, I do not think about me. In fact, I do not think about any of the people I know who are writers, because mm -hmm. doesn't writer and author feel like it means something really different? I'm getting ahead of myself. You're getting ahead of us, <laughs> but the short answer is yes, and we'll talk more about why in Transfiguration class, but this is not the transition to Transfiguration class. So Hannah, what's it like being an author? I'm going to tell you about what I think the two cutest things about having my current book, uh, Sentimental Education, out in the world mm -hmm. is. One, my friend Don recently told me that his absolutely delightful mother, Donna. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Don was visiting Donna recently and told me that she is on her second read through of my book. Oh, geez. <laughs> and I was like, Donna. Should I come? Should I come and visit you and we can talk about it? And oh, the other cutest one, cutest experience was mm -hmm. um, I got a text from my friend Hillary, who owns the little local bookstore down the street from me, mm -hmm. saying that she was like, oh, I keep forgetting to ask you to sign the copies of a sentimental education that we have in stock because there's this really cute customer in right now and they're a huge fan and they're buying a copy for their boyfriend and I wish I could offer them a signed copy. And I was oh, like, geez. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> just come, I'm just going to come to the bookstore. So I just like walked in and was like, hey. You want me to sign your book? And it was so cute. And we took a selfie. It was so cute. I love that so much. Yeah. So those are the only two readers that I care about. Mm -hmm. It's cute and fun. And I got to say so much more fun having a book out in the world that is like nice and that I feel pretty good about. Yeah. Because my first book was a book about um rape culture in Canadian literature. And a lot of really terrible men got really mad at me about it. Yes. That's my favorite thing about being an author is not being in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Marcel, we're finally doing it. We are finally talking about the author. Mm-hmm. Finally. Which in this case is not us being like, you know, she whose name we do not like to speak, but literally the idea of the author. And mm-hmm. this particular topic might just build on more previous episodes than any other topic so far. Mm-hmm. But instead of like cheekily suggesting you re listen to the entire back catalog. <laughs> Which, like, you should. You should. Yeah. But, yeah, you, should. you know, I'm instead going to suggest that we be very selective in this week's revision. Yes, I agree, Hannah. Let's start broadly. So in our very first episode on critical animal studies, this was episode three, Ooh. if you can believe it. Hannah, you beautifully broke down the relationship between ideology and discourse. And I stress beautifully because I continue to use this exact phrasing every time I have to teach my classes. Very effective. Me too. So Honestly, great. Another (laughs) great thing about writing. You just have to do it once and then you can just go back. So for folks who may not remember, ideology is our imagined relationship to the real conditions of our existence. Ideology is how we understand the world. And discourse is language that enacts power by generating knowledge. So understanding this relationship helps us to critically interrogate the very idea of an author as a construction or an invention, and not just the natural consequence of writing a book. Okay, speaking of interrogating things, in our episode on structuralism, we talked about the idea that narrative consists of a set of consistent structures like grammatical rules, which means that we can take a story apart and identify the pieces in terms of their relationship to the story as a whole. So structuralists believe that stories mean something because of a shared relationship between the structural components of the stories, that is their signifiers, and what those components are referring to, their signifieds, even though the relationship between signified and signifier is arbitrary and unstable. That Just go back to that episode if that part mm-hmm. feels, mm-hmm. feels mm-hmm. confusing to you. <laughs> so structuralism is important to our understanding of authorship because a writer can't predict if, how, or when the relationship between signifier and signified might change, or how that change might affect the reception of their work. Mm, So true. Okay, so speaking of reception, in our episode on celebrity, we talked about how celebrities are represented, as well as the development and transformation of the media ecosystems that let those representations circulate. Drawing on Lorraine York, we talked about reluctant and exuberant styles of celebrity and how one's subject position determines which mode of celebrity they are expected to perform. So this helps us to understand how the role of the author, particularly if you are a popular author, is itself performative. Mm, Yes. And we can't talk about the author without talking about books, because both are products of capitalism. (gasps) So in our episode on books, we... Books? Yeah, that one. We demythologize the book as an object by looking at it as one of, if not the first mass-produced commodity, the brainchild of a publishing industry that realized it could make a lot of money by mass-producing commodities cheaply and then selling them at a considerable profit. As they do. As they do. Moreover, investors in the book market actually anthropomorphized books so that people wouldn't just want them, but would love them, collect them, and identify with them. And love for the author had a lot to do with that. Honestly, there is so much more that we could talk about. And you know what? Maybe we will in Owls. I don't know. I can't predict the future, but I really want to start yelling about authors. Oh, okay. Let's do it. Well, the author might be dead, but Marcel is alive, and she's here to explain this joke to us in Transfiguration class. Ah, Hannah, I am so excited to take the lead on this episode. Can you guess why? My guess is that you have some jokes that you think are really funny about the author. Yes, 
I do. <laughs> I really do. You are correct. Okay. So I dug up this presentation from my PhD coursework years, and I laughed out loud at my own presentation so much. I think it might be my finest work. Okay. I mean, I love that. What's it called? It is called <clears throat> Authorship, The Dead and the Not Dead Yet. Oh, I get it. Like like in Monty Python. Mm -hmm. I'm not dead yet. <laughs> it's already so oh, funny. Oh, my God. Coach I, loves this. this. Is, there's going to be a lot of Marcel chortling with delight at her own jokes. <laughs> and that is one of my favorite things. Oh, shucks. That's a good thing we're friends. <laughs> okay, so I just want to give you a taste of my untamable cheek. And again, this was for a PhD seminar on textual editing with arguably the most straight-laced professor in the department. He, I don't think, found me very funny, but I did very well in this class. Okay, so let me tell you about this presentation, which I love, Authorship, The Dead and the Not Dead Yet, which is very funny. I can't even believe some of the things that I let myself get away with. The first slide of this presentation is an image of Roland Barthes pointing to a chalkboard with a cigarette dangling out of his mouth. And I had erased what he was pointing to and instead put my notes. <laughs> Marcel, it was very funny. I have used that same picture in courses that I have taught. Oh, we're both so funny. Yeah. Oh, my yeah. God. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Roland Barthes. Roland Barthes. Okay, so we're going to start with two key figures. They're both French. They're both French. They're both men. They're both dead. Roland Barthes and Michel Foucault. And the reason we're starting with them is because the Western literary tradition in English, the tradition in which you and I were educated, Hannah, mm -hmm. tends to figure these two Frenchmen as central to the question of just what the heck an author is anyway. Okay. So Bart and Foucault didn't like invent the idea that we can disentangle an author from a text because a lot of literary cultures have long, complex ideas about authorship. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. So Bart and Foucault introduce for us in our Western literary tradition in English a way of thinking about the author as a modern capitalist invention and a contributor to the circulation of discourse. Ah, discourse. Discourse. So what the heck does an author have to do with, is an author, is the author <laughs> a discursive construction? Yes, but we're not there yet. So. So sorry. Not sorry at all. <laughs> My dude, Roland Barthes, published, I'm sorry, coach. Your microphone is going to be wet by the end of this episode. So my dude, Roland Barthes, published The Death of the Author in the 1960s. In this essay, he argues that literary criticism is essentially held hostage by a desire to determine what the author intended to say. Mm. I personally think that with the exception of undergraduate essays, literary criticism has largely moved beyond the desire to discover the author within the text. But this is probably thanks in part to Barthes and Foucault's influential writings on the subject. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So. At the time, the sway of the author was so powerful that the critic's role in reading a text was to uncover the single, true interpretation of it. Okay, so instead of there being one true, correct interpretation, Bart, Bart wants there Bart. to be Bart wants there to be multiple interpretations? He does, yes. So imagine going to a conference on Canadian literature and giving a paper on the abundant usage of simile and metaphor in Heather O'Neill's novels. Everyone claps politely until the foremost Heatherologist in the country stands up and tells you that you've read Heather O'Neill's novels wrong. Okay, is this a real story? Because this did happen to me, but with Carol Shield. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, this is not a real story, but like... It happens all the time. It does. It absolutely still happens all the time. For me, it happens all the time. But it is no longer acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is no longer appreciated or tolerated 
or seen as like rigorous scholarly engagement, right? Mm. So Bath's point is that this mode of analysis devalues and limits the reader's capacity to find meaning in the text based on the words on the page. Okay. Okay. And his solution to this problem is to track down and murder authors? Mm -hmm. Yes, because he's French and that's what they do. Yeah. No. So it's not a guillotine-based literary critical move. Not yet. No. So Bax refers to this new criticism, not necessarily new criticism, but this new mode of criticism, as the death of the author because in reader-centered criticism, the author of a text relinquishes authority over it by the very fact of having written it. Mm -hmm. So you... Hannah McGregor, have written a book. Mm. Your name is printed on the cover of that book, and Mm. it identifies you as its author, Mm -hmm. right? It does. But your authority over how I, a reader, make meaning out of the words on the page died the minute that book left your brain and became a commodity circulating in the world. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So mentally, what feels tangled up for me right now is the sort of like structuralist dimension to Bart's argument, which is that based on that idea that like the relationship between signified and signifier is not something that the author can control versus the like capitalist critique going on here because we are talking about books circulating as commodities and arguably Mm -hmm. about authors also being commodified via the book industry. Mm -hmm. So is there a relationship there between the like structural critique and the capitalist critique or anti-capitalist critique? Uh, Yes, mayhaps. Mayhaps uh, the transition to Michel Foucault can help. Fun fact, guys, you know why he called it the death of the author? No, why? Uh, because in French, that's... Le petit mort. <laughs> what? Oh. No. <laughs> in French, the death of the author is la mort d'auteur. Mm-hmm. And it is a pun playing Ooh. on la mort d'Arthur, which was a classic, oh. M- Mallory's classic telling of the story of King Arthur. Wow. Yeah, it's a nerdy joke. <laughs> that is very nerdy. Yeah, it is. I'm impressed. It is. It is very... Oh, it is it's not a reference to an orgasm. It's not a reference to an orgasm. No, it has nothing to do with orgasms and everything to do with King Arthur, I guess. But that does suggest the kind of like quasi-mythical status of the author as a figure, right? Anyway, Bach, all well and good. Foucault, my homeboy. Let's hear what he has to say. So... Michel Foucault's response paper, What is an Author?, is what I would generously call an essay-length subtweet in which he rejects the very premise of Bouts's death of the author thesis by just fucking questioning everything. It is It is subtweety. It is. It is 100% subtweety. It is really like, oh, the death of the author? How can something die if it never existed? Mm -hmm. What is an author? Huh. Huh, Roland, riddle me this. But the other thing is that he doesn't, he at no point references Bout. He doesn't use his name and he doesn't refer to the title of the essay in quotation marks, but he does say the title of the essay. Not by accident, but like multiple times. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's shady as fuck. It's one of the most fun things about reading theory is really getting to dive back into times when people were just, like, being real bitchy about each other. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Truly. Okay. All right. So, to answer your question... About capitalism. So, Foucault agrees that what we call the author is indeed a capitalist invention, um, but where he departs from Bart is in the very possibility of extricating a text from the cold, dead hands of the figure that wrote it. And this is because Foucault understands the figure of the author as originating precisely from the type of literature that defines our modern Western individual individualist culture. So the very literature that 
produced the kind of criticism where people are like, ah, but what, but what does he mean is precisely the same media that uh that invented the figure who you could be like, what did you mean? Yeah, this is a history that I know primarily from a publishing history perspective, because particularly in Europe, when they're beginning to uh, like solidify and standardize the way that the publishing industry works, the mm -hmm. author is a really vital figure in the development of copyright law. Mm -hmm. And copyright law is literally about like the right to copy things. And so you need to have the idea that there are people who own ideas who mm -hmm. can then decide who has the right to copy and circulate those ideas. And so mm -hmm. the author does like literally emerge sort of around a discourse of like intellectual property and authority over mm -hmm. said intellectual property. And so it makes a lot of sense that hand in hand with this notion of like an authoritative figure who gets to decide where a text goes and how much it's worth, that person would also emerge as the one who gets to decide what a text means. That's right. So the thing about like both Balthus and Foucault's arguments is that they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -mm. They're both talking about the same ideas, but like from different approaches or taking into account different systems of meaning making. And Balt is just not as interested in like the circulation of power as like an ideological thing. Yeah, absolutely. He's more like, I want to be able to say whatever I want about Carol Shields, bitch. Yeah, I feel like Bath is often more interested in like the question of what art means, mm -hmm. whereas Foucault is more interested in the question of like how representation and discourse by extension fits into the larger landscape of modernity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. You often don't get the impression that Foucault is like sitting around being like, but how does one understand the function of a photograph? Whereas Indeed. Bapt is like, let's talk about how a photograph makes you feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Foucault's like, no time. We've got prisons to historicize incorrectly. What is a photograph? Is Foucault. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a bitch. Okay, so as you point out, Hannah, Foucault is not interested in, like, authorial intention. He is not interested in interpretation. He is interested in how the author as a construct functions in the circulation of discourse. And so the author of a text for Foucault is not a person, but rather the text's antecedent. So something that exists before the thing and logically precedes the thing. Okay. So, Hannah, mm -hmm. the book, A Sentimental Education, exists because you wrote it. In part, yeah. Okay? So, as a thing, no, 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 not in part. Yes, in part. No, not there in are part. All these publishers. Uh, Hannah? What? Hannah? What? You are the text's antecedent, okay? Gotcha. It cannot exist. You precede the book. Uh huh. You logically precede the book because you wrote the book. Yes. Okay. So, as a thing in our modern capitalist society, the book refers back to you and takes its meaning from you as its author. For sure. Yes. And Tell me again, how do we know who is the author of a book? Uh, the author's name is on the cover. Yes, that's right. Okay, good. And so, because Foucault is interested in discourse, the name on the book is not the name of a person. Mm -hmm. Your name on the book might be the same as your name, but it's not a reference to you. It is the equivalent of a description. Okay. A description of what? Put a pin in that. Okay. In our late capitalist society, I think that we can also think of that name as a kind of brand. Okay? Yes. Yeah. So if Hannah McGregor wrote it, it's going to be thoroughly researched, deeply meaningful, maybe some, maybe some whimsy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Some silliness at points. 
if Malcolm Gladwell wrote it, it's hot nonsense masquerading as popular science. Fact. That points to the unstable referent of the author because that's how we will interpret Malcolm Gladwell. Precisely. Okay. So the so when you see a new book by Hannah McGregor or a new book by Malcolm Gladwell, you have an idea of what to expect because the author's name is more like a brand than a person. Okay. So Hannah, you are an author. Mm. You wrote a book. Mm -hmm. The book is called A Sentimental Education. You wrote Mm. it. It has your name on it. You are also the author of your journal. Yes. Of the cards and the letters that you send to your loved ones, like me. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. What about notes and reminders that you leave yourself like a grocery list? Absolutely. Okay. No. You are the writer of these things, (laughs) Hannah. (laughs) No. You are the writer. (laughs) You are the writer of these things. What distinguishes your book from your grocery list is the function that you play as the author. Okay. So you can be an author of some kinds of texts and not of others. That's right. Yes. Yes. So way, way back at the beginning of this episode, you were like, well, like what even like, uh, I mean, they're writers. I know of writers, but like, what's the difference between a writer and an author? This is exactly that moment. Okay. So what is the difference between a writer (laughs) and an author? It is for Foucault, how the object circulates. Yes, of course. The author function is part of the circulation of a text via the publishing industry. Yes. The publishing industry is one huge part of it, but not the only part of it. Yes, because there's readers and there's literary criticism and there's education and there's all of the other kinds of ways that texts move through the world. That's right. And I'm sure... I know that the author function is so powerful that it can pull other texts into its orbit. Yes. So if you have an adequately famous author, things that they wrote that did not originally circulate as authored can then get pulled into their like authorial archive. And all of a sudden we're like Virginia Woolf's grocery list. Yes. Are now circulating under the author function of yes. Virginia Woolf, yes. whereas during her lifetime, they would have just been written ephemera. Exactly, exactly. We're not going to talk about Anne Frank at length, but Anne Frank, classic example of a person, a girl, a child who is writing a diary, but has become an author function through the posthumous publication of her diary. Yes, yes. Okay, so Hannah, you will definitely outlive me, but if you don't, I'm going to make a lot of money publishing all of your ephemera. Okay? (laughs) The Hannah McGregor collection. Receipts, grocery lists, to-do lists, sticky notes. Like three months younger than you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay, let's talk about more of these material conditions that... uh, affect the author function, okay? Okay, so here's one of the really key questions, Mm -hmm. I think, Mm -hmm. is how much control, because you said the author function, we can think of it as a brand. Mm -hmm. So how much control does an actual living human writer have over how their author function circulates? So my short answer to your question is that I actually don't think that an author has all that much control over how the author function circulates, okay? Because of all these other like webs of influence and what a theorist that we're going to talk about in a second uh, calls the machinery of publication and review, Um, Mm. like all of these things are very powerful that I think it can create the illusion that an author has a lot of control. Okay. But I'm not sure they do. But you might be pointing to the way in which an author could, say, latch on to social media as a tool 
with which they might refuse their own death by continuing to circulate unmediated text. Because there was no Twitter in the era in which Foucault was writing. Can you and imagine? So, he would be insufferable writing about Twitter. <laughs> Rest in peace, Foucault. You would have loved Twitter. So surely things like social media have an impact mm -hmm. on the author function. Yes. I think they, they would have to. Yes. Yeah. So what are some of the other kinds of systems and structures that we have to that we have to sort of keep in mind when we're thinking about the author as a function rather than a guy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. OK, well, now I'm going to bring in Jane Tompkins, who is an American writer and scholar, um, literary critic. Let's bring her into the conversation because she talks about, in her words, how authors are brought to the attention of their audiences. OK, so um, so she explains that, and I quote, the conditions of dissemination interpret the work for its readers in exactly the same way as definitions of poetry, in that they flow from and support widely held, if unspoken, assumptions about the methods of distribution proper to a serious or non-serious work. So, <laughs> so the reader's relationship to a text is shaped by the ways in which that text circulates and arrives in the reader's hands. Yes. Yes. So that would have to do with all kinds of things like literary canon, mm -hmm. like what books were taught in school, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. like, you know, what, like the fact that Shakespeare continues to be performed constantly, mm -hmm. but other authors of the same period aren't, mm -hmm. like how books are categorized by genre, like the kind of cover art they have. So like mm -hmm. all of this surrounding material that tells us what to make of a book before we've opened the page, exactly. first page. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so she, so she uses the canonization of fairly well-known 19th century American writer, Nathaniel Hawthorne. He wrote The Scarlet Letter, among some other things. Oh, yeah, I've read that. It was bad. <laughs> yeah, I hated it. So she uses him as a case study to really illustrate all of these moving parts, okay, and how these moving parts shape the reception and popularity of an author, okay? So, so remembering that Foucault says that the author is a description and not a person. Oh, Okay. 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 So we don't care about Nathaniel Hawthorne, the man. Yeah. We're interested in Nathaniel Hawthorne, the description. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to quote from Tompkins here. Okay. In the 1840s, quote, America needed a living novelist who represented both what was essentially American and what was best, scare quotes best, by some universal criteria of literary value, end quote, okay? So thinking backwards, Hannah, what kinds of qualities do you think would have made an author well-suited for this discursive role? Yeah, Marcel, I don't know enough about Nathaniel Hawthorne to know the answer to this. That is that is fair. That is fair and acceptable. Okay, so the answer is, it would have to be, this is according to Tompkins, because I also didn't know, uh, it would have to be somebody who wrote about American life in a humble but reverential way. It would have to be somebody who is already a fairly well-known author. Uh, and it would have to be somebody whose writing could make them a kind of spokesperson for the so-called democracy or so-called democratic way of life that the northern states were pursuing at this point in time. Okay, so those are the qualities that made Nathaniel Hawthorne well suited for this discursive role. But those qualities are themselves discursive. They are themselves discursive. And Nathaniel Hawthorne was by no means the only person who embodied these qualities, right? Okay. So so why him? Okay, great. I mean, great question. <laughs> Can you guess what the crucial precondition for his enduring legacy as the poster boy for American literature was? It's got to be, it's got to be like 
being in the right rooms. Yes, is a hundred shaking hands with the right with the right men. He was in the room where it happened. Is what happened? Okay. So this is not going to come as a surprise. The material conditions of Nathaniel Hawthorne's success are not going to come as a surprise to people who study the material conditions of culture, right? But as you point out, these things are all already discursive, okay? So the way that he writes about America, discursive, okay? So yeah, the idea of humility, the idea of his origins being humble. That's a discursive, you know, humility is a discursive construct. Sorry, I wouldn't say, I, I, I don't know if Nathaniel Hawthorne's origins are humble. It's that the, it's that the way that he writes about America oh, is humble. Oh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. So he's producing texts that discursively fit the function that we're looking for yes. in this moment. Yes, Okay. yes, but it's not you and me who are looking for it. No, I couldn't care less. No, no. But the people who were looking for it were the cultural elite of New England. Okay. So Tompkins describes this network of cultural producers in New England as, and I quote, a dynastic cultural elite which came to identify itself with him, end quote, him being Hawthorne. Oh. So remember that the the Civil War is going to happen, okay? The Civil War happens, the North wins, and so the increased social capital of the New England cultural elite is a huge factor in the way that Hawthorne's work would go on to be canonized as American literature because of the fact that Irrespective of like what he was intending when he wrote the things that he was writing, the network that he was involved with who latched on to it, they they came out on top of the Civil War. So the name Nathaniel Hawthorne becomes a description of a concept of Americanness that has a huge amount of cultural power behind it. Because it gives itself and it spreads itself. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a disease <laughs> sorry but okay but so l- I'll, let me give you let me give you some examples okay let me give you some examples okay 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 in addition to the network that he was a part of the mm-hmm. network that came after it so the the second generation or the the subsequent generation of cultural producers continued to publish his books posthumously and that meant that they continued to circulate people continued to review them people continued to buy them his books were published in series like little classics he was his work was called classic american literature when it was like you know i don't know 40 like years instantly. old yeah yeah and it continued to be included in anthologies that were used in in elementary schools high schools and universities so if it was being included in these literary reprint series and in these anthologies, that means that like American literature scholars encountering his work would encounter it sort of within this this discursive frame of like Hawthorne equals American literature. Exactly. The university system in America did not even consider American literature a field of study until after the Civil War. And so the very first American literature students in universities in America were starting their study of American literature with Hawthorne. And so I can I give you another example? I must. Please let me. <laughs> Fine. Okay. Fine. This, if you insist. <laughs> This is, again, this is from Tompkins. So so Tompkins tells us that in 1883, Yale's English students were allowed. This is Yale University, Ivy League, American University. Okay? 1883, Yale's English students were allowed for the first time, for the first time, to write about an American author. The topic for their junior essays was, and I quote, Hawthorne's imagination. So 
when I say that Bouch describes <laughs> authorial intentions as having too much sway, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> Nathaniel Hawthorne, the person, wrote some stories. As an author, he circulates in the discourses of American literature. Materially, his long-standing critical success symbolizes the social and economic class stratification that emerged out of the American Civil War, where New England's cultural producers got to determine what was American, what was intellectual, what was moral, what was progress. Marcel, are you familiar with the video game Katamari Damacy? No. <laughs> no, okay. what is this? It's, it's this video game <laughs> where you are this little ball, and as you roll around, you gather everything you roll over. Okay. And so starting, you roll over quite small things. But as you gather them, you get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. And so you can roll over and gather bigger and bigger and bigger things until you're like rolling over and gathering whole buildings. Okay. So it is just like the gamification of the snowball effect, but you get to like destroy stuff and it's fun. Okay. But this is the image that I have as I'm thinking about the author function. (laughs) Because it does, like when we think about a new author... It's like it does, you know, a new author does not emerge into a a blank space. That's right. Authorship itself has discursive weight and they emerge as author by virtue of their attachment to a text that will then have all of these. We've talked in the past about paratexts, like we'll have all of these other paratexts that say, this is a genre this author is writing in. Here's a photograph of this author, and the photograph is going to tell you something about them. Here's the author bio that's going to tell you something about them. Here's the presence of the author on social media, yeah. or here's the author mm-hmm. on Goodreads, or here's the yeah, here's an interview with them. Right, all of this yeah. stuff starts attaching, adhering to them right from the beginning. Even if they're super, even if they're like a total recluse, sure. Like, oh yeah, still the. The materiality of the book itself attaches all of this meaning to the author function. Mm -hmm. But then as the author function moves through the world, it just accrues (laughs) all of this, all of this stuff and gets and either disappears Mm because lots and lots and lots of authors get lost to history. Mm -hmm. But if it keeps going, it just accrues more and more cultural weight until the actual core of like a guy who wrote a book one time Mm -hmm. is like so (laughs) obscured by like hundreds of years of cultural meaning Mm -hmm. that attaches to that person no wonder Foucault's coming along and saying like how the fuck (laughs) no not you yeah. I'm oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Saying like, whoa, 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 like, how the fuck would we ever know what this person meant? We can barely know what this person means, yeah. like, as a person. Yeah. Let yeah. alone what they, an actual flesh and blood human being at some point, quote unquote, intended to say. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of cultural grist between this text and our encounter with it and the meaning that the author had. That's right. And like, we didn't. We didn't talk about editors. Like when I said. I mean, I kept trying to talk about the intervention of publishing and you. No, because because this is because this is about the author, Hannah. Yeah, I know I'm bad. No, you're not. You're you're ungovernable. Yeah. So even even an author's very first book, you know, begins their 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 author function on the cover begins to accrue all of this sort of discursive meaning but the actual things that start to produce that meaning are often things that have been done by other professionals in the book industry so it has more to do with the cover art the paper quality typesetting choices genre categorizations mm-hmm. editorial like all of this stuff uh, that is about how the book moves through the world which is like in dialogue with the text that the author produced oh, sure. but also not actually about the author themselves, except as as a function. Yeah, Tompkins talks about how, like, 
the intrinsic value of a text does not exist separate from the like machinery that brings the text to the attention of the readers. It's yeah. like it how could it? There there is no <laughs> intrinsic value is not a thing. <laughs> there is no outside to ideology no. and the author doesn't is not exempt from that. No. Not at all. I guess one one other thing that I think is worth addressing, and the reason why I think Tompkins is so useful, is because her using Hawthorne as a case study really hinges on the way that the Civil War shook out the social conditions for Hawthorne and his contemporaries, right? Because if if things had gone any other way, the the particular New England elite who really benefited from the results of the Civil War, like like that would have redefined the map. So so like there are authors who were contemporary with Hawthorne who were as popular, if not more so, in certain circles. But those circles, they didn't financially benefit from uh, from the war itself and its conclusion. Yeah. And and what I can't help but think is looking back to a 19th century example, we're looking at a historical period that is linked to the rise of a kind of sort of fixation on bourgeois individualism. But our hyper fixation on the individual and the kind of cult of personality that attaches to it only gets more intense <laughs> Every year, like late capitalism fucking loves fetishizing individuals. Um, and I think we can see that really clearly in the way that we treat our authors. Maybe we should talk about one in particular. Great idea. Well, we may not give a hoot what the author intended, but power and influence make it downright impossible to separate the artist from the art. Let's get specific. In Owls. Okay. <laughs> I think maybe I just want to start by saying the quiet part out loud, mm -hmm. which is J.K. Rowling is probably the most famous living writer. Mm -hmm. She is... The level of famous that makes her sometimes quite tricky to use as an example of mm. anything. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody is this far off the edge of the bell curve, mm -hmm. it's like, is this actually exemplary of anything about how culture works? Or is this just a really wild sort of outlier? <laughs> to quote Malcolm Gladwell, I guess. Oh, Hannah. <laughs> Sorry, you were saying and. And we have talked before in other episodes about how, like, the, the black swan effect, right? Like, that that the particular conditions of the Harry Potter series' phenomenal popularity are, like, I, I, not, non -reproducible. Non -reproducible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, non reproducible. Non reproducible. Yeah. Yeah, non reproducible and not representative. And yet, I think, I mean, Maybe she's not symptomatic. Maybe she's got more of a causal relationship. But but she stands in for like a particular kind of contemporary celebrity author mm -hmm. who is um, endowed with an enormous amount of cultural power mm -hmm. by virtue of the success of their books mm -hmm. and who actively and happily uses that cultural power to try to influence the world. Yes, including the publishing world and in including through sort of maintaining deliberate ongoing control of the meaning of their texts mm -hmm. by by sort of controlling their circulation and their recirculation, but also by virtue of becoming this kind of like public intellectual figure that people are like, oh, you wrote some kids books that people really, really like, and therefore you are qualified to have an opinion on literally anything. everything. <laughs> yeah. And and I I do think that in that sense, she's similar to a lot of writers. Like, I don't, I don't know who else has the kind of power she does, but I would say, like, 
a Margaret Atwood is in a very similar position in a very different way. A George R. R. Martin mm-hmm. is in a similar position. Mm-hmm. We could look to like Rick Rick Riordan, I think is his name. He wrote the Percy Jackson books and he like very self-consciously was like, ah, my author function has a huge amount of power. And so I'm going to create a series called Rick Riordan Presents mm-hmm. that I use to uplift the voices of marginalized authors mm-hmm. writing children's literature. And I, I think too, thinking about like, authors using social media to engage people like we could also think about John Green is another like yeah. good example of someone who is like I know that I'm famous I know that people are reading my books I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to explain classic American literature to yeah. readers or like Roxane Gay yeah. like it's so hard to separate Roxane Gay's writing from her internet personality totally so there is the sense that that authors are more public than they have ever been, mm-hmm. that our sort of fixation on on celebrity culture that is so much a characteristic of late capitalism has led to the sort of celebrityification of authors, that there's a lot of aspects to authorship in the 21st century that are that are different from what they looked like in the 19th century because the the whole machine of culture is different but that rolling is really has got to be the the top example of this mm-hmm. of somebody who has leveraged their author function mm-hmm. into a kind of material power mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that outstrips what the author kind of could do historically in their own lifetime with the notion of their own authorship. Yes, for sure. Where I think the unpacking of the author function in relation to Hawthorne, for example, continues to be helpful for Rowling is in terms of thinking through, like, or in terms of being able to see and identify the web of other influencers who are playing a part in Rowling's continued successes, right? Mm. So, like, it's true It's true that Twitter didn't exist in the 19th century, but Rowling does still have publishers who will publish her books. She does still have reviewers who will enthusiastically review her books. She's different because she's writing popular fiction and and not being like no one has yet tried to like make a um a mm, I was like you about to say nobody's teaches university courses about her cuz they definitely take do. Take it back. I take it back. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, so people are people put her on syllabi. Uh publishers have republished editions of her work like the the illustrated editions the adult covers like like the machinery is continuing to enable her fame and continuing to enable the the influence of her author function right well so there's a really interesting thing happening with her author function right now so so one of the early moves that her publishers made to um, popularize the Harry Potter books was to really attach the books to a particular story of her life. And that was the story of her as an unemployed single mom writing this first book in a cafe in Edinburgh. And that is an iconic story that is as powerful as it is selective in the (laughs) details it includes. You know, it implies a lot of things about like financial hardship and bootstrapping and the notion of the undiscovered genius that is all really sort of, you know, a cultural construct that doesn't have a ton to do with the actual events of history. (laughs) Are you suggesting that her author story origin story is discursive, Hannah? I'm suggesting it's discursive. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) But she was attached, right, very firmly to the books from the beginning. And we see, like, as soon as the second book came out, it starts to get accompanied by these letters to her by children that, you know, again, do this particular kind of work. When the movie started to 
come out. There was a lot of attention to the fact that she maintained a level of creative control over the movies because she was figured so much as this person who, like, the entirety of this world had just erupted from her head mm-hmm. like Athena from the skull of Zeus. Yep. And, and so we needed her to have firm control over anything else that emerged from it. That's right. Yeah. You know, Warner Brothers played that game. Bloomsbury played that game. Everybody sort of really got on board mm-hmm. with this, with this sort of construction of her. And that is starting to change now. Definitely. They are still all of these powerful cultural Machines. <laughs> Machines, yes, thank you, are still working very hard to extract as much value as possible out of these properties. Mm-hmm. But they have figured out that actually she's become a bit of a liability. Yeah. And so we are watching them, I think, try what is just like when I put my critic hat on. What is a sort of interesting juggling act, Mm -hmm. which is trying to separate the art from the artist while the artist is still alive and tweeting very actively. Oh, yeah. Totally. Like, clearly, Warner Brothers has a lot invested in us all being, like, fans of Roland Barthes right now and being (laughs) like, ah, the author is dead. Like, Warner Brothers would love for the author to be dead. Totally. Because then they would not have to worry about what a nightmare the author is. Mm -hmm. And she's out here on Twitter being like, Say the author is dead all you want, those checks still cash. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the author is not just a discursive construct. She is also a function of the capitalism, <laughs> right? Like she's also a yeah. commodity. And like there's this yeah. very real sense that like whether we name her or not, the money all still goes to her. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if she's being increasingly hidden by the machinery of culture. Yeah. She is still getting the money. <laughs> She's still getting the money and people are still listening when she says stuff, whether it's like, oh, actually, Remus Lupin's middle name was Dooley. And people are like, oh, my God, I didn't know. Dooley or uh, sex is real and it's a binary and you hate women because you want to say otherwise. Like, Because the checks continue to cash, she continues to be able to talk and people hear it. Like she can talk more because she has kept her very particular voice as the author in active circulation and in active production of new meaning for these texts. Yes. Like sort of like like keeping this kind of death grip Mm -hmm. on the meaning of the text. And like there's no better example of this than Pottermore, right? No, no, no. Pottermore and the goddamn tweets. Like the fact I just the fact that she can just tweet out things that happen to the characters, it breaks my brain. (laughs) Like that's it defies it defies the function of the author of a book. Oh, that's interesting. It breaks your brain because it defies the function of the author of the book. Can you say more about that? So the author of the book, if they're going to tell you something that happens in the world of the book, they got to put it in the book. And then if the author thinks of new things that they want to add to the story of the people in the book, they have to write another book. But J.K. Rowling doesn't do that. Right. So it's fucked up because she's because she's she's attempting to author through tweets. And it's like, you can't author through tweets. You write tweets. You author books. Stop it. Exactly. Exactly. The grocery list isn't canon, but because it's J.K. Rowling, if she just puts Harry Potter bought grapes, it becomes fucking canon. It's so interesting to think of Pottermore as this sort of liminal space that she created to be like, this is like, it's a publishing platform. Mm -hmm. And it's tied to the entire enterprise in a more official way than Twitter, mm-hmm. right? Because, like, Twitter is not a platform she owns. It's just a place where she's saying things. Mm-hmm. But Pottermore is a platform she owns. And part of its function from a business perspective was to take total control over the audiobooks. Oh, interesting. The audiobooks, you can only buy them through Pottermore. You don't buy them through another venue, right? So it's like... It's not Bloomsbury Audio. It's Pottermore Presents. I think 
Bloomsbury gets a cut, but importantly, Audible doesn't. Right? Because the distributor for most audiobooks, like audiobooks you you access through a distributor okay. in a way that is not quite the same with how you access print books, mm-hmm. but like because it's a it's a born digital medium, you need a digital right. distributor. And that was her being like, no, I am the digital distributor. Mm-hmm. The books belong to me. So like it is, it was a literal act of taking control over the circulation of the text back, but also taking discursive control over the circulation of the text meaning mm-hmm. by producing all of these like, sure, you've done your a million versions of a sorting quiz. Here's the canonical sorting quiz. And part of that was like, I'm going to produce more knowledge about this world in a way that like maintains my authority. But the way in which she produced it and continues to produce it is so reminiscent of the way fan fiction and sort of fandom sites in general operate Mm -hmm. that it has blurred this weird line of like, Okay, you're the author, but you're also participating in this kind of other discursive world Mm -hmm. that has its own different set of rules and norms about authorship and the relationship between authorship and canonicity. And you're kind of breaking those rules. Because nobody in the fandom world gets to come along and be like, well, there's one version, there's one correct answer, and it's that wizards pooped in the halls. (laughs) And then just magicked it away. What? It's the second worst thing she's ever said. Yeah. God. Uh, It's interesting to look at her ongoing cultural power. I think it's also interesting and important to note that the vocal critics of Rowling and her politics are a vocal minority. Mm -hmm. The vast majority, I think, of Harry Potter fans of Harry Potter readers either know nothing about Rowling's transphobia or like kind of have heard about it and do not care. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I think is really important to remember when we are talking about the discursive power of the author function is that as per Foucault, when we talk about power, power is not an ephemeral or theoretical thing. Power is material and has a material impact on actual human bodies. So as an example, I I keep thinking about this as a key example, J.K. Rowling has a foundation Mm -hmm. that donates money to things. Yes. And that can also withhold money from things. Mm -hmm. And so she relatively recently withdrew all of her foundation's funding from the Edinburgh Rape Crisis Center because they brought on a trans CEO and were explicitly, are explicitly a trans-inclusive rape crisis center. And that has then left that particular organization, which is really important and doing really necessary work, in, like, distinct position of financial precarity. Like, we're we're not talking like yes we talk theoretically about power but like it's so important to to bring power back to its material impacts mm-hmm. and remember mm-hmm. that like when we are talking about power we are talking about the actual things that it can do in the world to actual people's bodies yes so it's not like yeah what a culturally powerful figure isn't that interesting i mean yes it is mm-hmm. and also what are the implications of having this level of cultural power? How can the author function become something that is so powerful it can hurt real people? Yeah. And in case one is inclined to despair, I think it is also important to remember that the winds of change, they do blow. (laughs) And the fact that the major cultural entities that benefit financially from rolling success have been actively distancing themselves from her. I think that indicates to us that they are aware that it's in their financial interest to distance themselves from her, which means that the impact of 
the vocal minority of people bringing attention to the hateful rhetoric that J.K. Rowling circulates, spreads, um, are gaining traction. And that Mm. I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but... No, but it's a good reminder that (laughs) that screaming really loudly about things does actually have an impact sometimes. Screaming really loudly about things that are real and that matter, right? Like, to go back to Nathaniel Hawthorne... Classic Marcel, never stop bringing up Nathaniel Hawthorne. You know I love to talk about Nathaniel Hawthorne. Like, Tompkins' like analysis of his success makes very clear that the machinery responds to social change, right? Mm. And so capitalism is a fucked up system, but it is a system that listens to money and the new generations of people who are having money are saying, actually, trans women are women. Listen, if Disney is going to make a a Mickey ear pin with the trans flag on it, that means that Disney is saying trans people have money and I want it. Therefore, (laughs) I'm going to start I'm going to start saying (laughs) trans people are welcome here and look forward to our future episode on Disney and homo nationalism. Oh, my God. It is complicated and it is fucked up. And like I said, I don't want to come across as Pollyanna. But what I do want to stress is that J.K. Rowling's author function power that she uses to hurt people does not need to be permanent. That's what I want to say. That's my point. It's a good point. God damn it. Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch Please. If you have questions, comments, concerns, or praise, come hang out with us at Oh Witch Please on Instagram or Twitter. And, of course, the best place to hang out with us, patreon.com slash Oh Witch Please, because that's where we put all of our exclusive (laughs) perks and so much bonus content. And bloopers which i guarantee this episode will have some real juicy ones oh my god so much plus now is a perfect time to join our patreon because we are about to start releasing pilots for the new version of this podcast that you will get to give us feedback on if you are a patreon supporter so you should do that and be there be in the room where it happens. Exactly. Which please is distributed by Acast. You can find the rest of our episodes on Acast or at ohwitchplease.ca, which is expanding every day thanks to our digital projects coordinator, Gabby. You can also find transcripts, merch, sign up for our newsletter. Oh, heck, just go check it out. Special thanks, as always, to our executive producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. (laughs) To our social media manager and marketing designer, Zoe Mix. (laughs) And to our sound engineer, Eric Magnus. I just found out recently that we know Eric in real life. I mean, I don't, but, you know, we as as a team... (laughs) He is a team. He's our real he's our real life friend. Incredible. He's in real life. He's IRL. At the end of every episode, we shout out everyone who left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. So you have to review us if you want to hear Marcel wish she had a river that she could skate away on. I'll never get it. I can't sing Joni Mitchell. Thanks this week to Beverly Sade. Arania. Arania. Arania? Yes, you may. I'm going to guess it's Arania. Yes, you may, because it's, yeah, I don't know. KC Stainsby, Bones Books 99, Sarah Madeline, Lindsay E.H., Itty Bitty Britty, Chris in Pacifica, Amelia Beth B., Shimmer 2003, 
And this one's for you, Marcel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> even my legal spelling. That's so cute. So cute. Thank you. We'll be back next episode to add to the appendices. But until then. Later, witches.